Hey folks, my name is Mo Amir and this is Van Color, British Columbia's bonafide culture and politics TV talk show. We're hosting a duo of storytellers tonight. All Elite Wrestling's Adam Copeland, one of the greatest wrestlers ever, will be beaming in. But first, my parents immigrated to Canada when I was four. And let me tell you, as a child of immigrant parents, growing up is complicated. Our first guest tonight offers a glimpse into her upbringing as a second-generation Korean-Canadian in her one-hour storytelling show, No One Special, which is a part of the Vancouver Fringe Festival. You can catch it at Waterfront Theatre on April 26th. She's toured North America with Ronnie Cheng. She is a Canadian Screen Award-winning writer and producer who has contributed to the writing rooms of Kim's Convenience and Run the Burbs. She was a producer and writer for the 2022 and 2023 Juno Awards, voted by you as the number one best comedian in the Georgia Straits Best of Vancouver Awards. She is Julie Kim. Julie, hello. Hi, Mo. Sorry for that long intro. <laughs> Sorry for making you say that. I you know have I so many you. accolades, so many <laughs> achievements. No. I got to catch my breath for a second. I you want some water? <laughs> no, um, no, I appreciate it. It's nice to be back here. It's been a while. It has been mm -hmm. a while. Now, I want to talk to you about your show, No One Special. Yes. Your childhood home plays a central role mm -hmm. in this storytelling show. So so tell me about your childhood home. Mm -hmm. It's funny because uh, when you were mentioning that you were a child of immigrants and mm -hmm. you mentioned me as a second generation, I mean, I think that that's technically true, but I was actually, I was born in Canada, okay. but like less than a year after my parents, uh, you know, settled. Uh, and so I spoke only Korean for the first few years of my life because my parents were the right. only people that I knew. So I, <laughs> so I always, uh, I marvel because I'm like, I actually am ESL, yeah. even though I was born here. Uh, and then I learned English and then let go of Korean pretty much altogether right. after I started going to school. So it's sort of like, a 1.5 generation. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Not first generation, not second generation. I can appreciate that. Yeah. And then um, after uh, my parents uh, got together, they started a convenience store and we lived on top of that convenience store. So we basically lived downstairs and upstairs very cohesively. And that was our ecosystem really for my whole childhood. How does that affect your childhood or influence your childhood, I guess, where where work is so close to home and it's all kind of connected because it's a family business. Yeah, well, it's interesting from a parental perspective. My parents were always there, as in they were always around to like monitor us and feed us and things like that. But then they were also very busy. Right. So, you know, a lot of modern day parents talking about being present. They were physically present, but like always so busy and preoccupied. So not at all you know, sort of emotionally uh, present in a way where we connected together, although that's like a cultural thing, too. Sure. So it was interesting. It was great to have them always around. But then also we never we were like babysat by the TV. And, you know, <laughs> me as the oldest uh, daughter, too, like I watched my siblings and had to work at the store also. So it right. was a mix of work and personal life for me. Also, I was always available for them to say, like, stock this shelf or come help me, you know, <laughs> get some supplies and things like that. So I we really didn't think of it as um, at, with any sort of division. Right. <laughs> so so getting getting put to work at a young age, what mm -hmm. how else would you describe the experience of being brought up by immigrant parents. Mm -hmm. Because for me, my parents were, you know, their whole mentality was, we came to this country to give you a better life. You better do your best. Yes. So if I brought them like a 94% on my final exam, they'd be like, where's the other 6%? Yes, we have the same upbringing <laughs> for sure. But in a way, um, I never thought of hard work as like a big deal. Like I always saw them working. They literally would start working at like 7.30 in the morning and then close up the store at 11 p.m. So to me, working hard was like no normal. Um, and in the beginning, I was reluctant, of course, because I was like a little kid and I wanted to have fun and yeah. I want to lie down and watch TV, but they could pull me in at any time. And and I remember, I think it was like eight when I started asking for money and then they just like laughed in my face. <laughs> um, but yeah, there is that pressure, I think, because they they know how hard they're working and they yeah. know how difficult of a life it is. And of course, they don't want that for you. And you hear this a lot with kids of uh, immigrants. It's like my parents are really strict. They wanted me to study to be a doctor yeah. and a lawyer. But then it's like, why wouldn't they want you to do <laughs> something and make a lot more money and have a lot more potential and freedom to have 
quite literally a, a better life with more resources, right? And but as a kid, of course, you're not supposed to understand that. You're just like, I hate my parents, right? <laughs> of course. Well, yeah. like most kids, right? Like most. how did your parents take it? when you decided to become a comedian? Oh, they did not have a say in the matter. I became a comedian after I'd already like gone to school okay, yeah. and started working. Um, you know, I worked for a few years on Bay Street in Toronto. Mm. So I, by the time I was doing comedy, it's like uh, I literally did not care what they thought. And I didn't tell them. <laughs> like, I, you know, I think... I think, and th this is where the topic gets a little bit heavy, but you know, when, when you have parents who put a lot of pressure on you and might not uh, give you um, a lot of grace or options, or mm. they're always criticizing you, what happens to some of us is that we literally stop caring about what they think. I've got friends who run all their decisions by their parents right. and you know, they're like their counsel and stuff. I just stopped giving them a vote. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm sure they think it's nice now when I'm on TV, of I'll, course. I'll send them this link. <laughs> Please um, do. But uh, yeah, but it, it didn't really matter. And I, yeah, I just came to comedy like after I started doing a few other things, which, you know, in retrospect, I think was kind of good because I got to see the world in a number of different ways and I really had to work for it as in work for my creative career for and sure. I appreciate it a lot. Now one thing that may differentiate our immigrant child experiences mm -hmm. is that I was the only child so I was oh. center of the universe uh -huh. still you know my parents were very strict and uh -huh. I think when I when I started podcasting and and rolled into media stuff my dad was very confused by why I was doing it <laughs> and, and not pursuing like real estate or something else yeah. um, but you were not an only child, right? You already mentioned you had a sibling. Yeah, I had two siblings. Two so siblings. it's the okay. oldest of three. And it was so for the longest time, it was me and my sister. She's a couple years younger than me. And then six years after that, my little brother came along. And I think it was the first time in my life where I realized what sexism was. Because all of a sudden, mm. everybody, including my parents, were so much more excited about this little baby that was to come and it was significant that he was a boy they gave him a korean name like a middle name oh. my sister and i not neither of us have that is that a distinction of honor uh i think it kind of was really i think okay. it was i yeah. remember them polling their friends and other family members what his name should be and then all of a sudden <laughs> it could be because time elapsed and they had more experience but then when he came around there was like i love yous and hugs and i'm like in yeah, that was corner. my life. Yeah, well, <laughs> must be nice. I'm in the corner like, oh, I didn't know you guys did that, you know? And and then, let me tell you, I'll go a little bit um, into what I say in the storytelling Please. show. When my, my brother was a couple of years old, my mom brought her parents over from South Korea mm. to take care of him. And all of a sudden, we are seven people in a two-bedroom apartment above the store. Right. And the math yeah. doesn't add up. So my grandparents slept in one bedroom and then my mom and my dad and my brother and sister slept in the other bedroom. And they said that I was now sleeping on the couch in the living room. And I slept there for about seven or eight years of my whole childhood. And sure, it's because I was the oldest child, but my family actually has a history. And a lot of Asian cultures have a history of putting burdens on the girls, the daughters, mm. often the eldest children who like, you know, you turn five and your parents are like, you're a man now, right? Like you, you're responsible for your siblings. And sometimes resources go to the sons yeah. wherever they fall in the uh, birth order. And there is just that kind of inherent uh, sexism there. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, yeah. you've definitely tantalized me. I hope you tantalized the audience <laughs> to watch your show. Julie, this was a pleasure. Thank you so much for your time tonight. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Folks, that was one of the best in the business, Julie Kim. Make sure you check out her show, No One Special, April 26th at Waterfront Theatre here in Vancouver as part of the Vancouver Fringe Festival. Tickets for the second show are still available. Now, after some business, stay tuned because one of the greatest professional wrestlers ever to do it is here on This Is Van Cullen.